In economics, there is one graph that shows you how everything works. The economic participants, the markets, and the market interactions that make the economy what it is. It shows how consumers and firms depend on each other to survive, and the roles they have to play in markets. It even shows the role that government has to play from time to time to make everything work as it should. And it's called the circular flow model. The circular flow model begins with consumers and firms. Both of these market participants interact in one of the two markets in the domestic economy. The first market is the factor market. In the factor market, consumers own and supply inputs, which are demanded by firms in order to produce products. The second market is the product market. Where firms take inputs and produce goods and services, and then supply them to meet the demand of consumers who need goods and services to meet their utility. And standing by, ready to assist when one of these markets fails, is government. There's also a flow of payments that makes the circular flow model work. In order to purchase inputs in the factor market, firms must pay wages to consumers, which equate to cost payments for firms. Those wage payments become income payments that consumers will use in order to buy goods and services through consumer spending in the product market. Consumer spending becomes revenue payments for firms, which can help them to earn profits. The cycle continues and goes on endlessly. Firms seek to maximize profits by keeping costs low and generating higher revenue while consumers seek to increase their wages to have greater disposable income, allowing them to consume more goods and services in the product market. If one of the markets fails, government intervenes to correct the failure and let the circular flow model take hold again. This is how economics works. Let's take a closer look at the factor market. The factor market is the location where factors of production are exchanged between consumers and firms. There are three factors of production that are bought and sold in the factor market. Land, labor, and capital. Land is defined as the natural resources used to produce goods and services. It cannot be artificial or manufactured by man. Any resources that are natural and used to help produce goods and services is defined as land. Labor are the tasks and jobs performed by workers and the workers themselves. And the third resource is capital. There are three different types of capital. There's physical capital, which are final goods produced for the use in the production of other goods, such as equipment or tools. There's human capital, which are the skills or knowledge used by workers to produce goods. You go to school in order to gain human capital. Next year, you'll go off to college and acquire greater human capital to make you a more valuable worker and thus increase your wages. And the last is financial capital. This is money or assets used in order to purchase inputs. When all three factors of production are purchased and assembled together in order to produce goods, this is known as entrepreneurship. Every great business starts with a greater idea. Steve Jobs. Warren Buffett, Elon Musk, Richard Branson. They're all entrepreneurs. They started with an idea, took risks in order to acquire costs in the purchase of resources, put those resources together, and created a very successful business. It's definitely not as easy as it looks. Most businesses fail, but the few that do succeed can do really great things. But it starts in the factor market. This is a graph of the factor market. Set by wage per input and quantity of inputs available in the market, the natural market forces of supply and demand for inputs will set the equilibrium wage per input at P1 and the quantity of inputs that will be sold in the market at Q1. In the factor market, firms will demand inputs because they have an incentive to seek productive resources in order to make products for profit. Consumers will supply inputs for a wage so they can gain income to purchase goods and services in the product market. And this is the graph for the product market. Set by price per product and the quantity of output that will be available in the market. The natural market forces of supply and demand set an equilibrium price per product at P1 and a quantity of output that will be produced at Q1. In the product market, consumers demand goods and services in order to maximize their utility and satisfy their needs and wants. Firms will supply goods and services in order to maximize their profit and compete with other firms. Let's take a look at the heart of any market, supply and demand. In both markets, the law of demand is in effect. The law of demand dictates that there is an inverse relationship between price level and quantity demanded. When the price level increases, the quantity demanded decreases. And when price levels decrease, the quantity demanded increases. The law of demand is visually shown in the demand curve. In the product market, for example, we can plot the various price levels and quantity demanded by consumers in the market. As you can see, 
Quantity demanded only increases if consumers can get the goods and services at a cheaper price. Each additional good beyond the first good purchased is less useful to consumers, and therefore they're not willing to pay the same price for the second good. This principle is shown exactly in the buy one get one free deals you see at the mall. You only need one pair of shoes, but you'll get the second pair if you get it for free. Essentially, it cuts the price of each pair in half, and you have an incentive to buy the second pair of shoes. When we connect each of these prices and quantities demanded together with a curve, we see a downward sloping demand curve. The law of supply is also always in effect in the market. The law of supply dictates that there is a positive relationship between price level and quantity supplied in the market. If prices increase, then quantity supplied will also increase. If prices decrease, then quantity supplied will also decrease. You can visualize the law of supply in the supply curve. Again, let's use the product market as an example. When plotting various prices and quantities supplied in the market, you can see that as prices increase, the quantity supplied in the market increases with it. The reason for this is the profit motive. Firms are going to be more willing and able to supply a greater quantity of goods and services if they can receive greater revenue per unit because prices are rising. More profitable goods will be supplied in greater quantities. It gives the firm a better chance to maximize their profits. If you're willing to pay $400 for a new PS4, then of course they'll flood the market with PS4s and probably produce less PS3s. When connecting these price levels and quantities supplied together, we see an upward sloping supply curve. To further demonstrate the laws of demand and supply in the market, let's use the American labor market as an example. In order to produce goods and services, firms demand labor. And if wages fall from P1 to P2, the quantity of labor demanded will increase because the firms can acquire more workers at a cheaper price. But if wages were to increase from P1 to P2, you would see the quantity of labor demanded by firms decrease because now each worker is more expensive. This means higher costs for the firm, and so the quantity of workers that they demand decreases because they're hoping to avoid those higher costs. In the labor market, consumers become workers and therefore supply their labor. If wages were to rise from P1 to P2, workers in the labor force will be more likely to supply their labor at higher wages. And so the quantity of labor supplied increases as wages increase because it means a greater potential to earn income. But if wages fall from P1 to P2, workers now lose the incentive to provide their labor and as great a quantity as they used to. It's the reason why people who work in low-wage jobs don't seem to be as happy about going to work. Think about it. When was the last time you met a McDonald's worker or a Taco Bell worker that was really happy to go in? Hi. Hello. I have recently been placed in charge of garbage. Do you have any that requires disposal? Totally empty. Well, when it fills up, don't be afraid to call me. I'll come take it out most urgently. Lower wages means that workers lose the incentive to work. And so if wages decrease, the quantity of labor supplied in the labor market decreases with it. Workers are just going to go find something else to do with their time. So what sets wages and quantities in the factor market? It's called voluntary exchange. Voluntary exchange is when firms and consumers gather freely in economic markets to achieve a mutually beneficial exchange for both parties. It's like a silent negotiation. Let me show you how it works. Provided is a graph for the American labor market. At the top of the demand curve is the maximum wage that firms will pay for one worker. And at the bottom of the supply curve is the minimum wage that workers will work for. Through a nonverbal negotiation, both parties will seek to maximize their incentive in the labor market. For workers, it's reaching a higher wage. And for firms, it's hiring workers at the lowest wage possible. In this example, as negotiations begin, workers will offer their labor at $20 an hour, while firms will offer to pay $10 an hour. With no agreement reached, negotiations continue and workers offer their labor at $15 an hour, while firms offer $12 an hour. With no agreement reached, negotiations will persist until an equilibrium wage is agreed upon, $13 an hour, and the firm can hire four workers at that wage. With firms acquiring their labor and consumers earning their income, let's now focus on the product market. The product market is the location where economic goods are exchanged between consumers and firms. As in the factor market, the laws of demand and supply are in effect and are driven by the maximizing behaviors of the economic participants. Let's look at a graph for the Ford F-150 market in the United States. Consumers demand Ford F-150s in order to maximize their utility, and Ford will supply F-150s in order to maximize their profit. Natural market forces will set an equilibrium price of P1 for a Ford F-150 and a quantity of Q1 of F-150s sold in the market. As the price of F-150s decreases from P1 to P2, the quantity of F-150s demanded by consumers will increase. And if the price of Ford F-150s were to increase from P1 to P2, the quantity demanded of Ford F-150s by consumers would decrease. From Ford's standpoint, 
If the price of Ford F-150s were to increase from P1 to P2, the quantity of Ford F-150s supplied by Ford would increase due to a greater chance of maximizing profit. If the price of Ford F-150s were to decrease from P1 to P2, the quantity supplied of Ford F-150s would decrease due to the fact that each Ford F-150 is less profitable. Just as in the factor market, voluntary exchange will set price and quantity in the product market. Let's use this example of the Ford F-150 market in the United States. Let's pretend you're the buyer. Provided is your maximum price to purchase a Ford F-150 and Ford's minimum price they will sell it to you for. The moment you walk on that dealership, you know you're trying to buy that truck for as low a price as possible, and Ford is trying to sell the truck to you for as high a price as possible. The negotiation begins, and Ford offers to sell the truck at $40,000. You offer $20,000. With no agreement reached, negotiations continue, and Ford offers $35,000. You offer $25,000. With both sides wanting to make this deal happen, an equilibrium price is agreed upon, and you leave the Ford dealership with a $30,000 Ford F-150. Now that example is just you. Imagine all consumers in the market for a Ford truck. At an equilibrium price of $30,000, Ford will be able to sell four trucks. Okay, it's time for a quick review of today's major points. The circular flow model shows each of the economic participants and the markets that they interact in. It also includes the payments that are needed in order to make these interactions happen. In the factor market, three different types of inputs are purchased, land, labor, and capital. Capital includes physical capital, human capital, and financial capital. Each of these resources is put together through entrepreneurship. In the product market, economic goods are exchanged between consumers and firms. In both markets, the law of demand is always in effect. It states that there is an inverse relationship between price level and quantity demanded. If price levels increase, quantity demand will decrease. If prices decrease, quantity demand will increase. The law of supply is also always in effect in both markets. This states that there is a direct relationship between price level and quantity supplied. If prices increase, quantity supplied will increase. If prices decrease, quantity supplied will decrease. The demand curve, which visually shows the law of demand in effect, is the combination of price levels and quantity demanded in the marketplace. The supply curve, which shows the law of supply in effect, is the combination of price levels and quantity supplied in the marketplace. Prices and quantities are set in the market through voluntary exchange. Beginning at a buyer's maximum price and a seller's minimum price, nonverbal negotiation will continue until an equilibrium price and quantity is achieved in the market. Thank you for joining me today. I'll see you next time on Intro to Macro.